because nothing is worse than people who do not respect you enough to believe that you are capable of being agents of your own uplift. Progressive whites are determining what are the standards that blacks should live by. Obviously, you know, people would say that the reason for this is because there is a perception. Uh, and when I say a perception, I don't even know where the perception is. Uh, I don't know if most uh, black people feel this way in America or if it's just certain groups within the black community. But there is a perception that's being pushed by the liberal media that uh, there is uh, racial animus on the parts of white cops uh, toward blacks. Uh, th that's the narrative that's pushed, and it's why these stories get picked up. Um, what do you say to that? In other words, w w even I, when I hear some of these stories, you know, your first instinct is to think, wow, did it have to, did it have to go that way? Uh, why couldn't they have averted this tragedy? So what, what is your... Uh, your feeling, I mean, about, for example, the George Floyd case. Right now, this is red hot. What do, what do you say as somebody well, who's been in this all, world forever? You've, you've uh, dealt with these problems. Well, let's look at the, some facts. I know that's a strange word to use today. <laughs> but the very fact that 85% of the rioters, and many of them are destroying black businesses, are white. They are not blacks out there just, uh, engaged in this kind of violence. I certainly is a profile of the people who have been rioting for a year in Portland, Oregon, they're burning Bibles and whatnot. But again, when you look at this defund the police campaign, the poll says 82% of blacks in poll to ask about defunding the police. They are not supportive of defunding the police. 60% of blacks poll when asked if racial discrimination is a principal barrier to your progress, the answer is no. And so the question is, where is this great outcry from the black community that says that institutional racism is a principal uh, issue that they're facing? But hasn't this always been the case, though, Bob, that, that this has been peddled since, you know, Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton? They claim to be speaking for the black community, but many of us know and you're telling us they don't speak for the black community. But but. They, they take that on, and somehow, I don't know if it's corporate interests or, or uh, media interests, deputize them uh, as spokespeople for the black community when you're telling me they don't speak for the black community. Well, we think about the statement that Al Sharpton made at the funeral of uh, George Floyd. And this blows my mind. Al Sharpton said that white America has had their uh, foot on the neck of black America for 300 years. That's why we have never been able to progress and be all that we could be. That's a, that's a, first of all, it's a lie. And it's also, it's a profound statement of, uh, of impotence for someone to say that we have not been able to progress when we have, the, the Wilson Center has documented the fact that when we were denied access to hotels, medical schools, insurance companies, we built our own. We had our own Wall Streets. And yet, uh, people like Al Sharpton can presume to speak for black America. And, and, but again, there were four studies over a course of 12 years by the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. This is a liberal think tank in Washington, DC. When they surveyed blacks every four years to ask them in, in order of importance, what are the critical issues you're facing? Race only came up at 8%. It was health care. It was economic development. But yet these facts are never presented. It's as if someone said, if you don't have fact-based truth, then lies become normal. Well, lies about what is, what is representative of black interests is becoming normal today. That's why what we're doing at the Woodson Center is giving a voice to the voiceless in the black community. That's why we brought together 2,500 uh, uh, black mothers of children who lost children to urban violence. They are saying, we support the police. We are against defunding the police. I just, I, I marvel at where we are in the culture right now. I, I think that, you know, many of us think, wow, we elected a black president for two terms. 
who are all the racists, whites, that voted for a black exactly. president? There are not enough blacks in America to elect a black president. You need a lot of white votes. And of course, tons of people uh, voted to have a president who's black. Now, I disagreed with his policies, but I think a lot of us hoped that simply the optics of having a black man in the White House would change the narrative. But it seems like things have actually gotten much, much worse in the last few years. Well, and I and I agree with you. I really think that not only have we progressed, but the fact is that uh, there I, that represents a moral revolution in America that really puts a lot of distance between uh, our, our racial past and the white America has gone a long way. But unfortunately, there are still white guilt has become the new black power. And the message that's being sent to black America is that we should be, be defined by what demands we can make on white America. In other words, uh, black identity has become synonymous with black impotence, that somehow to be authentically black, you got to profess your impotence. And, and whites have to, in order to purchase their innocence, they have to profess their guilt. Well, this is a, uh, a dangerous kind of uh, 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 conflict. But the, but the answer forward is to give voice to the voiceless. That's why what the Woodson Center did this past week is we had a forum that brought J.D. Vance from Hillbilly Elegy together with Clarence Page. Both of them are from Middletown, Ohio, because we really believe that we need a, a multiracial coalition that brings together the interests of low-income whites with low-income blacks. Bob, you were just talking about uh, something that you did recently with J.D. Vance and Clarence Page. Uh, I know of both of them, uh, Clarence Page uh, is a black American, J.D. Vance is a white American, but J.D. Vance wrote Hillbilly Elegy and grew up in a very economically depressed, culturally depressed white community. So uh, why are you bringing him uh, into this conversation? Because I think elites on both sides uh, are using race to divide us and so and and so that whites living in trailer parks who voted for trump are portrayed as bigots which is not true they were voting for trump because the president gave them a voice on issue, issues of economic global capitalism what they were against and and low-income blacks are not given a voice either voice are being exploited and so what we wanted to do at the Woodson Center is recognize that blacks, low-income blacks have more in common with low-income blacks than they have with those elites who purport to represent them on either side. It's extraordinary, so isn't is, it, that, that what you're just saying about the elites? I mean, when you talk about Black Lives Matter, uh, this is Marxist uh, women, l lesbians, they, 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 they claim to speak for blacks, but most blacks in America have biblical values, uh, even if they stray from those biblical values. I think that's part of who black America is, the uh, people who go to church. And some people come in and they say, we speak for black America, and they're putting forth an anti-family, uh, anti-church uh, doctrine. It's a Marxist doctrine, but somehow the media, the white elite media, they, they love it. They eat it up and they present them as legitimate voices in the black community. Oh, what, what makes uh, Black Lives Matter just right for progressives because it's anti-God and anti-family. So they are the right kind of black folks as far as progressives are concerned. Even the Black Panthers and others in the past, they did not quite fit because they were not hostile to the family or hostile to those values. But the Black Lives Matter are just the right fit for progressives because they're anti-family. But they're also typical of Marxist, like the, the, uh, the organizer of it. Now, uh, the corporations have given $98 million. And while other Black Lives Matter uh, soldiers are breaking into stores and looting stores, they are busy buying mansions <laughs> in white areas 
a $1.4 million mansion. They spent three, the leader spent $3.2 million in purchasing a number of, uh, of upscale homes in white areas secured by the police. And they're doing what Marxist leaders do, and that is accumulate resources from others and then celebrate themselves by purchasing, accumulating wealth for themselves. This is following the Marxist uh, uh, tradition. I mean, it seems to me, you know, the the more I uh, talk to you and think about this stuff, it really seems the media is the problem. In other words, that if they did not uh, give a megaphone to some of these uh, folks, that we wouldn't know about them. We would listen to common sense. But, you know, they're not uh, they're not having you on CNN or they're, they're basically sticking to a narrative and they don't really care. In other words, they're, they're not actually asking black people, what do you think? They're sort of assuming in a condescending, uh, paternalistic, ultimately racist way that they know what blacks think and that they're going to deputize whom they choose, even if it's not in accordance with most of the black people in this country. Well, I think it's even worse than, uh, you know, I, I say I, I grew up in segregation. I was stationed in the South, in Mississippi, in the 50s and early 60s. But there's a part of me that longs for the old-fashioned bigot. <laughs> because nothing is worse than people who do not respect you enough to believe that you are capable of being agents of your own uplift. Progressive whites are determining what are the standards that blacks should live by. There's even a teacher now who would refuse to accept an essay written about Dr. King because Dr. King used the word Negro and they determined that Negro is offensive to blacks. Nobody asks black America whether it is, but they are. And I would not be surprised if that didn't result in a demand for them to remove Dr. King's statue, just as they did in, Rock, in Rochester, New York, with Frederick Douglass's statue. So I don't think there's any end uh, to where the progressives are going. But the only thing that can stop them, and what Woodson Center in 1776 is trying to do, is to provide the means for uh, everyday working men and women, blue collar and low, to speak for themselves, to stand up and say, these progressives do not speak for us. We speak for ourselves. The Woodson Center is trying to get the resources to provide that kind of platform. And if the networks won't produce it, we will develop our own way of communicating this pro-American uh, supportive uh, agenda. I want to say real quick, I ought to have said it instead of my goofy uh, introduction, I should have said how I met you. It was through Chuck Colson, uh, the Colson Center. Um, I think it's important for people to know uh, your relationship with Chuck Colson just because uh, he, he was so respected in so many uh, communities. But other than Chuck, I wouldn't have known of you. So I was so thrilled to get to know you. And I guess I want to say that there are a lot of uh, evangelical churches, white evangelical churches, that they've got involved in critical race theory. Uh, they, they don't understand the wickedness of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I want to say to them, if you really want to help black people in America, if you really want to bless uh, communities that are struggling, uh, first of all, you get a copy of Bob's book, Lessons from the Least of These. I should have mentioned that, Lessons from the Least of These. But Check out uh, the Woodson Center and partner with Bob because, you know, Bob, I, I guess as I talk to you, I think to myself, there are so many guilty white people in America, especially in the evangelical church. And I understand that they just they want to do something, but they're allying themselves with people who are causing harm to black communities. The tremendous irony and tragedy and pathos that they want to do something, but they don't know any better. And they're having CRT seminars in their churches. They don't know that this stuff is harmful. I guess I want to say to these people, uh, go to the Woodson Center, uh, get a copy of Lessons from the Least of These. If you want to do something, um, check that out. Uh, you, you must see that uh, even more than I do, that there, there are a lot of evangelicals uh, or mainline Protestants, they're so lost on this issue. They want to do something, but they're, 
they're just getting sucked in uh, to BLM and and that kind of thing. Well, I'm trying to get in on a race game. I'm going to organize a group of CREs, that's Certified Racial Exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> CREs, and okay. we're gonna, we, 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 yeah, we're gonna, and and our, and we're gonna be teaching, uh, uh, you know, we're gonna do B I B L E training. B I B L E, that sounds familiar. I can't put my finger on it. B I B L E. Uh, well, now, do you guys do stuff in churches? What do you all do? Well, what what we, what we've done? First of all, we have uh, authored curriculum for teachers, and we have like 8,000 downloads uh, the first two weeks when we, uh, at the 1776, so that uh, some of our members have testified before state school boards. And in a couple of instances in Ohio and other places, those school boards have rejected 1619 and instead accepting 1776. We're also developing uh, curriculums and, and we've spoken to charter school representatives, these, their parent groups come to us, their corporations coming to us saying, we don't want to do critical race theory uh, training or uh, to give us an alternative. So the Woodson Cert, along with our colleagues, are developing alternatives to race grievance training. And so, uh, but we, well, we need your help to help us to do that. But please, if you want an alternative to race grievance training, I called it. In fact, instead of C R C R D, it should be die. <laughs> D I E, yeah. Well, no, seriously, people don't know how don't know how harmful this stuff is, and they're getting sucked in. So I want to say, folks, if you're watching this on YouTube, for example, please send this video to your pastor uh, or to anyone you know, and say if you want to do something good on this issue. Look to Bob Woodson, look to the Woodson Center, look to 1776 Unites, uh, because I know that people, they want to do something. Uh, so, folks, please share this video. I, I can't, you know, I can't reach your pastor myself, uh, but it's really important we get the word out. We, we, we struggle to get the word out. We need your help.